I don't know. I don't know how to. Good evening. This is the regularly scheduled 
meeting of the Historical Society of Frankfurt for September of 2023. Tonight, our speaker is going to be Adam Levine, who is an expert on the history of, among many other things, I'm sure, uh, the, the history of Frankfurt Creek. He's been consulting with the Philadelphia Water Department for 25 years, and he has been a friend of this society probably just about as long and has spoken on the topic of the history of Frankfurt Creek at least once before, but we didn't record him on that occasion. So this is a nice opportunity now that we're, we're broadcasting on YouTube and Facebook, this is a nice opportunity to get Adam down in a permanent record with the very important information that he has on the uh, history of the creek. Uh, so we've, we've brought him back. The topic happens to be something that's particularly close to my heart. In addition to uh, being the programmer for these meetings, I am a retired lawyer. And I began my career as a water pollution enforcer at the Environmental Protection Agency here in Philadelphia. I arrived in the very early stages of the enforcement of what's now the Clean Water Act. And although I hadn't ever heard of Frankfurt Creek when I moved to Philadelphia, I certainly knew about um, uh, the, the various uh, problems that were going on in the water uh, shed here and other, other major city areas. And so I was quite enthusiastic about starting my career trying to deal with those things. And uh, it turned out I was right in the early stages and, and we were designing the airplane while it was in the air already, uh, sort of reconstructing it uh, in, the, in the first uh, three or four years of the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency. So it was an exciting time and I'm glad to have had a part in it and uh, I'm glad to have Adam here tonight to uh, keep us get bring us up to date on the history of Frankfurt Creek. Thank you very much for coming. And uh, now you, uh, it's all yours. I'm going to do something very daring here. I'm going to try to hide this little blue banner here, and I hope it doesn't shut everything down. There we go. Thank you, John, for that introduction. Uh, this I have been coming here since about the time I started working for the Water Department in 1999. Uh, 1999 was the first time I came here. Uh, 1998 was when I started working for the Water Department. And this place has really come a long way in those, in those uh, 25 years or so that I've, I've known of, of, of the society. I commented on the paint. You, you can't see this. Uh, if you're uh, viewing this on YouTube, but the paint job here is is really nice. It looks much brighter, much much uh, much more inviting. Although it still looks somewhat like a basketball court to me. Uh, I want to get a basketball and get a hoop in here. So, uh, but the name of the talk here, the sad history of an urban stream. It'll become apparent why I'm calling it a sad history. Although those of you who live in Frankfurt or are familiar with the creek know know that that it know that already. Um, okay. uh, even in this picture, this picture from 1898, already the stream, the, the creek was being polluted by factories. It was being polluted by su human sewage coming out of the houses that were, were built up along the creek. Um, so it, although the children there, if you can see them underneath the tree, are playing in the creek, it, it, even then it probably wasn't something that, that, was, that would have been recommended by any uh, medical professional, although, although kids will basically swim in anything, as we all know. Okay. Sorry about all this. Here, what's, I don't know what's going on here. There we go. Okay. 
Okay, here we go. I'm hitting, I was hitting the wrong arrow. This is, uh, I just turned 65, so I'm entitled to uh, be technologically deficient tonight. So there are lots of ways to look at a creek and, or, or more broadly, look at the watershed of a creek. Um, the, I, and I've seen two numbers for the square miles of the Frankfurt Creek watershed, which is 30 or 35 miles, but it's a fairly small watershed as they go. The Delaware River watershed by comparison is 12,000 square miles. The Schuylkill River is about 2,000 square miles. So this is just a little piece of, of the whole Delaware River watershed. Um, but it, the, the, uh, the watershed covers parts, parts in Philadelphia and also in Montgomery County. And all the tributaries in Philadelphia are, are out of sight underground in sewers. Um, and that includes the list on the screen, Wingahawking Creek, Rock Run, Little Taconi Creek, and several others without names. I'm gonna talk about these a little more uh, once we get going. Uh, another thing to note is that Frankfurt Creek in 1799 was de declared a navigable stream by the federal government. And that became very important when the city was trying to maintain the, the navigability of it, if that's a word, um, and having uh, conflicts with the federal government. I'll, I'll also talk about that. Um, and then, um, uh, so, and here's another another picture of the watershed, and you can see everything below Cheltenham Avenue on that on that uh, that which is the diagonal, the straight diagonal, which is the city line. Uh, there's no streams contributing to to the to Coney Creek there, and then the Frankfurt Creek. Um, this next this next uh, map is an older map that will show you why it's called the Frankfurt Creek watershed, not the not the Tuckany Creek watershed or the Tuckany Creek watershed or the Tuckany Tuckany Frankfurt Creek watershed, which there's people at some people at the watershed who know history that drives them crazy when it's called all three names because if on this map from 1848 the Wingahawking Creek is coming in from the left side of the the map and then the Tuckany Creek is coming in from the right and they join to form the Frankfurt Creek at I and about I and Ramona streets. Uh, this map was made when Frankfurt was just a borough before the city was consolidated into the boundaries that we know today. I'll show you a map of that a little later also. Um, I'd like to show these, these maps. And even if you're in the back row and can only see the barest bits of this, uh, uh, of this map, you'll get the picture. And if you've seen any of my talks that I ever give, I always show these three this th series of three stream maps, the historic stream maps. These are the streams that were that existed before before Europeans came and started uh, building building Philadelphia. Um, there were streams all over the city, including if you can see in the map where Center City is. It seems to be the highest concentration of little streams. And besides the fact that it was the narrowest part of of this, the distance between the Schuylkill and the Delaware, probably having all that water there was one of the reasons that William Penn decided to, or at least his surveyor, Thomas Holm, decided to settle, be, to make that the first settlement in, in, in Pennsylvania. Um, so this is what we had, and, and this is all that's left. You can see that most of the city is blank other than north of Pennypack Creek and then Winga, Wissahickon Creek and then a few little streams into the Schuylkill and then um, in far northwest, northwest Philadelphia, north, north, the northern part of West Philadelphia, Indian Creek. Um, and where all these streams went was into the sewer system. Um, and they were used to drain both stormwater and sewage from the neighborhoods that were being built around them. And if you want a much longer version of this, this, the sto this story, um, I, there, you can probably find some, some version of it online or just look for another talk when I give my Creek to Sewer talk, because that's what this is all about. I'm focusing today, though, on Frankfurt Creek, because here I am, and that's... Um, so just to continue along this vein a little bit, why, uh, why were the streams put underground? Um, 
this this is the map of the city before con before consolidation showing the 30 30 different municipal entities that made up what now is philadelphia still philadelphia county but what, what now is philadelphia city with a tiny two square mile Phil city of philadelphia in in in, in the location uh, where it is i can't point here today but um and so uh, by extending the city from two square miles with consolidation to 129 square miles, there were a lot of problems with draining that 129 square miles. Um, much bigger valleys, much bigger streams to, to worry about. And uh, so they decided to start putting the streams underground for a number of reasons, for health concerns, because polluted uh, water was, was not good to have flowing through your neighborhood. Also, the smell of polluted water was believed to cause disease in the 19th century, just the miasma theory of disease before they understood about bacteria and microbes. Also, by putting the streams underground, it, it opened up a lot of territory for, uh, for real estate development. And real estate development equals increased tax revenues for, for, for Philadelphia or for any community. And it was also the cheapest way to drain the city by, was by putting these streams underground because that way they, they could follow the stream valleys which flowed by gravity and uh, the, the pipe streams uh, would then not have to be pumped. You wouldn't have to pump the sewage. It could just flow by gravity, usually to the Delaware or the Schuylkill rivers, but there were plenty of sewers that emptied directly into Frankfurt Creek. So I'm just going to talk a little bit first about some of the tributaries that were lost as, as this whole process was going on. And one of the things that they that I didn't mention just a second ago, but which 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 I call the valley effect of having a stream. When you have a stream valley running through uh, uh, an area that's developing as Philadelphia was, uh, the, the development basically stops at the edge of the valley. Uh, and you can see here in this picture along this this where the sewer is would become ashdale street after after the valley was filled in above that pipe and you can see at the edge of the valley the row houses are have already been built up on the the upper left of this picture and until this the the stream is put underground the valley is filled in the streets are built and infrastructure put in water pipes gas pipes uh the development will not continue across there but as soon as the, that infrastructure is done, uh, then in Philadelphia anyway, especially in the 19th, early 20th century, you know, it didn't take long to fill that, fill that valley up with houses. Uh, Little Taconi Creek, which is the creek uh, at the bottom of this, this picture, this is again from the 1848 DRIPS map. Uh, Frankfurt Avenue is what's called Main Street in this picture. Um, Little Taconi Creek was also completely obliterated, which is a word that engineers used when they talked about burying these streams. Uh, and one of, the, one of the features that still exists in this area is the Globe Dye Works up, up on Worth Street uh, between Torsdale Avenue and Worth Street. Well, Torsdale Avenue is where Tacon Little Taconi Creek once flowed, and you can see here the creek flowing, flowing through the middle of the dye works. This is from a insurance survey from 1881, these, this incredible collection that the Free Library has scanned and put online. Um, so in, in 1895, you can see here the, the Little Taconi Creek uh, flowing through uh, through the, the what they're calling the Greenwood and Balt Dye Works, but that was also known as the Globe Dye Works. And you can see Torsdale Avenue is already laid out in the dotted line right above the, right on top of the creek. Um, and by 1910, a little bit of the Torsdale Avenue had already been built. They had already buried some of the creek uh, below below the dye works, but you can still see the the, the line of of the creek that still exists. Although Torsdale Avenue is, seems to be more prominent in this picture than the creek itself, because they didn't dye the they didn't paint the creek blue in this picture. And then finally, in the 1929 map. Torresdale Avenue is there, and that's basically the configuration we have today uh, with the Globe Dye Works was sort of split in half, and uh, um, and there was no longer a bridge over the creek from one part of the Dye Works to another. 
So th there were a couple of unnamed tributaries. Uh, there was Rock Run, which I showed you the pictures of, which came in above the Winkahawken Creek. And then there were a couple of unnamed tributaries until you got to the county, the, the county line, uh, Cheltenham Avenue. Um, the upper one in this picture um, is one that one that's called Adams Run, unofficially. It never had a name on any map. The USGS, the United States Geological Service, which named streams, never gave this one a name. And uh, and then there was a smaller stream down below. You can see where it flows uh, flows from a little pond, uh, then both of them emptying into Taconi Creek. On this second picture, you can see that the Oak Lane Reservoir had been built by 1910. Uh, at, on high ground, which was part of the filtration system of the city. It was uh, built up on high ground so water could flow by gravity. And this stream uh, flowed from, from uh, about 2nd and uh, Masher Street was one of the little, the little branches of it, flowed through the, what was originally Cardinal Doherty High School property and then off into, into the creek um, around Adams Avenue, which is why we call it Adams Run. The other creek, uh, the other creek was much smaller. But the interesting thing to me was that I just found a document in a file that, that someone gave me that this little Adams Run was not put underground until 1966, which, which I had thought that streams were, they were long ago done burying streams by then. Uh, but, but in 1966, the water department Put, buried this stream partly because the the uh, prince the reverend uh, who was the principal of Cardinal Doherty wanted, I think, to build a playing field where the stream was flowing. So, so a lot in a lot of these cases. Um, so you have, if you can see the Sturgis playground there, that's that's a, a lot of the headwaters of these small streams often became playgrounds or parks. And the same thing with the only playground or Alni. I'm not. I'm not from here, so I don't know if I said that right or not. But, but um, uh, that was done, that was built on land that the the other smaller stream flowed through. And because the the streets, this the the that sort of winding streets between the the school and the and the and Crescentville Road and then the Taconi Creek Park are are sort of suburban and in any way. It's a little hard to follow, but the creek does follow under under those roads through an apartment complex. And I've talked way too much about this because part of me talking about this was to say, I'm gonna put up a post on my website uh, about this, about a visit I made uh, up there uh, just, just in the past week or so. So I've spent too much time talking about it. You should all go to my website and see see, see some of the pictures and some of the other information about this. So when I saw this, this on Google Maps, uh, something jumped out at me. Here you have a gridded part of the city. This is, this is Roosevelt Boulevard, Everett Street, going at that weird diagonal and then taking a jog and then Cranford Avenue uh, taking another jog back in the other direction. And I, when I saw this, this weird street cutting across the grid, um, th this to me is always a clue that there's, there was a stream involved in this. And sure enough, if you go back to the old maps, there's, there's an upper part of the Little, Little Taconi Creek. Uh, and you can see Cranford Avenue as the dotted line and Everett Street going up there. Uh, so it's, it's, it's sometimes I find things not by looking at old maps and seeing the creek and then, and then uh, looking at new maps, but sometimes I can see the evidence on the new maps. This is a, these are just some pictures of the Everett Street sewer under construction. It was a 12 foot diameter pipe um, that, carried, uh, that carried the creek, uh, uh, that captured the creek. And you can see how open, open the landscape was then in 1917. Um, and it's interesting because right near there, I think is Tyson Avenue. And, and that was the first sewer I've ever I ever went into was actually a branch of it, it was the little Taconi Creek, but it was the section that now runs under Tyson Avenue. Um, I've been in a sewer three times. It's been been the the highlight or the low light or the low the worst the lowest part of my 
career or something. So there's some joke in there, but um, so this is Frankfurt Creek as it used to. It used to take a jog about Roxborough Street, a jog to the north through Bridesburg. Well, Rock, there was Roxborough Avenue or something used to be there. It used At least that was, in any case, it used to take a jog to the, let's not confuse the neighborhoods. It just took a jog before it hit the Delaware River, went to the north, and then went looped around the neighborhood of Bridesburg where you had, if you can see on the, the little peninsula that seems to be formed by Bridesburg, you have the, the, the chemical works, the Lennox chemical works, which became the Roman Haas chemical factory on the, on the south side of the mouth of the creek. And then you had the Frankfurt Arsenal on the north side. And, and so this is a view looking from the Delaware River up the creek with the chemical works on the left and some of the grounds of the arsenal on the right. So, so there probably is at least one person in the room who could identify every single church steeple in that picture, but we won't get into that right now. Um, and here at Bridge Street, farther up the, the creek was where these boathouses, this is a picture from 1914. Um, and the creek sort of meandered in that in that part of the creek it was very very flat very marshy the creek meandered around had big loops and i'll uh, will those will come into play in a, in a few minutes too the the sort of almost oxbows tiny not not big oxbows like on the connecticut river with where or the mississippi river where they can be miles long but but they still caused they still caused some problems um, so as, as I think I said, uh, the three creeks, not the three tenors, but the three creeks in 1916, uh, the, the Winkahawking you can barely see coming in from the left. The Taconi Creek is coming, coming in from straight in the middle of the picture coming in. And then the Frankfurt, the two of them join and form the Frankfurt Creek. And I'm just gonna show you some pictures of the Wingahawking, which was the largest stream that the city ever put underground. It was about 21 miles of streams. There were two branches of it and a lot of little tributaries to those branches. And it took them about 50 years to, to bury the Wingahawking Creek. There were a lot of factories along the creek that were using the water of the creek to, as the, as the factories later used the water of, of Frankfurt Creek as any factory along a creek does. If it can get clean water out of the creek to, to bleach its fabric, to dye its fabric, uh, it, it, will, it will do that. And then being along the creek, it used to give factories the right just to dump their wastes, their used dyes, their used bleach, whatever else, other waste they had, just to wash it right into the creek. Um, these are just some pictures, two pictures showing the, the size of the sewer that was built to capture Wingahawking Creek. And again, you can see what the, the, this valley effect that um, there's, there are houses off in the distance, but until this fairly deep valley at this point was, was uh, until the creek was put in the pipe and the valley was filled in, uh, the, the, there was gonna be no development in this, in, in this area. This is a little further downstream. This pipe is even bigger. That pipe we were just looking at is about 15 feet. This is probably about 19 feet. Um, and then by the time you get to the mouth of Wingahawking Creek, you can still go down into Juniata Park uh, below I am Ramona. And below the playground, there's a hole in the fence that the neighbors keep. If the, the water department fixes it, the neighbors just rip the hole in the fence so they can get down and get on the trails. And you can get a view of this this out, outfall uh, of the Wingahawk. It's 20, it's the largest pipe in the water, in the sewer system of Philadelphia, which has more than 3000 miles of pipes. This is 21 feet high and 24 feet across. And it's running, there's no water coming out of it now because there's now sewers that capture all the flow in dry weather at least, uh, and carry it to sewage treatment plants. If, if that man was standing there in 19, any time before say 19, 19, 19 or 20 something, uh, he would be would have been knee deep in raw sewage that was just flowing out of that pipe day and night. And that was the that was the sewage of 
Mount Mount Airy, Germantown, and every everything in between, all the way down to the creek. So these are just some pictures showing some uh, what I was just saying that in, until the until the creek has gotten out of the way, nothing is going to be built. So here is this is 1895, uh, showing this is through the Logan neighborhood, and some of you might know what happened in the Logan neighborhood, which shows up. This is probably 1910, and you can see the creek. There's only a little bit of the creek left, um, and where the creek is gone, the houses have already gone up in those. 20, 20 year, 15 years. And then by 1942, this was a solidly built neighborhood. But then, uh, then by the 1980s, the neighbors started realizing what, what the neighborhood had been built on. And the triangle on the bottom, part, the bottom right of this picture is the Logan Triangle, where, where the valley of the Wingahawking Creek was filled with coal ash and a thousand houses had to be torn down. And that definitely is a whole other whole other talk you're all going to have to either come and see me do or tune into. So this is, this is one of the bridges over Little Tacony Creek. And of course, when these creeks were put into sewers and the, and the creeks were filled in, these bridges just became streets. I guess they tore the bridges out and they just put a normal street in. Um, and one of the things about being, the, the Little Taconi wasn't considered navigable, except by maybe rowboats or something, but the Frankfurt being navigable, not only uh, did the city have to continually advocate the federal government to try to get them to dredge it and to keep the channel deep enough, but they also had to put movable bridges in. Uh, these are two of these movable bridges. I think the, the top bridge on, over Oxford Street is is a swing bridge. The bridge pivots on that middle middle column, and the other one I think is a drawbridge um, at Bridge Street. I know it's a drawbridge where the two two sides go up to allow any any traffic to go through. Not that there was a whole lot of traffic on the creek, um, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, one one of the first channel changes in the creek was was somewhat related to this old bridge, or this old bridge is sort of uh, an example of uh, the problems you can have because this this six arch bridge, uh, if a few of those arches get plugged in during high water, then the water just goes around the bridge out into the neighborhood. So. Um, so in 1901, the same year this picture was taken, and this is a, a little bit out of order, uh, but this was an 1881 plan to to re, re, reroute the creek and to channel the dig a new channel for the creek. That the federal government, in 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 a, in a number of reports, as I'll mention in a minute, decided not to do that for for various reasons that I'll talk about. So um, I had to get this talk done last night. So if, when I was going through it today, I realized this one was out of order. Um, so, uh, but, but if you remember this 1881, the Army Corps of Engineers. But in 1901, the city itself uh, decided to reroute the channel. You can see the old channel on the left takes a sort of weird sharp bend. And every time you have a sharp bend, when you have a creek, uh, that that just means in high water the water is probably going to spill out over the over the far bank. Um, it just it just makes it harder uh, harder to control the water. Also, if you and on the so on the right you can see that the the channel was was given much smoother bends, sort of like the same thing in a highway. Uh, where if you want to go fast, you have to have smooth, you know, you have to have smooth curves, not just these sharp curves that are going to cause cause a lot of accidents. And so this is this was what the channel looked like, at least one picture that they took of it. And I don't think you can even find a channel in there. Um, I, I can't see where the creek would be flowing other than uh, it probably was flowing in, in, in a number of places. And so they tried to dig a new channel. Um, and this is part of the process. This is in 1901. And here's, here's, again, continuing. You can see they're putting a rock, rock wall. And this is probably looking 
the, maybe the other direction, showing the channel as it's finished. I'm not sure what the piers are there. They might have been related to a bridge or, or something that was out in the creek. Maybe they're removing them at that point. So the city did do some work on the creek uh, to try to maintain it and try to keep it from flooding. Uh, and, but, the, the, but every time they appealed to the federal government for help, uh, even though the, the being a navigable stream, the federal government wasn't sort of in charge of what happened, they refused to do anything. Uh, in, in an 1881 report, they basically said there's not enough traffic on the creek for us to justify the expense. Um, in this 1913 report, uh, the same thing. Um, you can read this in the video. Uh, I'm not gonna dwell on this on this picture, but the but the but the um, the last line on this page, for the above reason, I have to report that in my opinion. Frankfurt Creek is not worthy of improvement by the general government, meaning the federal government. And this is a major in the Corps of Engineers. That's his judgment after, after studying the stream and studying the, the amount of traffic that was, that was being carried on it, the amount of commerce. So, um, and this is 1913. So in 1916, the city, the city did, did some dredging on its own. And in 1931, they came up with a plan to, um, to rechannel the creek, to, to 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 take out some of the bends and to dig a new channel, but that was in the depths of the depression, so they had no money to do that. And meanwhile, because of the development upstream, the uh, the creek had been the creek was flooding a lot. The 1920s and 30s, there were probably about a dozen different major floods, not just on the Frankfurt Creek itself, but also uh, the Wingahawkin Creek flooded often through the Logan neighborhood. Um, which probably didn't help with the ash fill. It probably helped settle that out underneath those houses. Um, th there were a lot of factories. Uh, there's, there's still a lot of factory buildings in Frankfurt, but then there were a lot of operating factories. And the owners of those factories would write letters to the mayor saying, you're, you're, uh, you know, the creek, is, the creek is polluted. The creek is flooding our factory. The creek is causing us, costing us money. And the best the mayor could do in, during the depression was to, would be was to hire, uh, not hire, but to work with the federal government through the Works Progress Administration, one of the make work programs of the of the Roosevelt era. And they they employed if you if you could, you probably can't see this picture very well, but the, those little ridges there are this crew of a thousand people probably mostly men, uh, but I'd like to start out by calling them all people in case there were some women there. Um, and they're all, they're basically working with picks and shovels and wheelbarrows, digging out a new channel to, to eliminate this big bow in the creek. Um, but that was about all they could do. The city also went in and took out some, took out a lot of trash out of the creek, um, but but in, in, until the federal government relinquished control, that was basically all the city could afford to do it in, in that in that time period. And so the creek kept kept getting more and more silted up. Uh, this is these are just a series of pictures taken from from about Castor Avenue all the way down to the to the mouth of the the creek in 19, on the more or less on the same day or in the same week in 1934, looking at all the the silt. And, and this is an example of one of the, this factory owner was one of the ones who complained, the Edgewater Finishing Company, he was one of the ones who complained about being flooded out. But look where that building is built. It's built right in the, right in the channel of the creek. It's certainly in the floodplain and it's right up against the creek. And, and if the creek rises, water is going to go in that building. Uh, but because the factory owners employed a lot of people and had political pull, they were able to to more or less do what they want and get what they wanted in that in that time period. So this was this this would be the creek in dry weather. You know, there's those kids aren't more than ten years old, and the water is not even up to their ankles. But in uh, in 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 
in uh, times of heavy rains, you know, that 1,000 or 2,000 cubic feet per second that could rise up to 10,000 cubic feet per second. And the creek channel it was was so filled up with silt it couldn't could couldn't nearly hold that much water and it it ended up spilling out into the neighborhoods and um, and causing scenes like this way too often. So it was on the it was on the and and this is about how navigable the creek was at that point. Uh, and and this is admitted in those federal reports. Uh, basically, rowboats could could navigate the creek. That's about it. Uh, maybe you could get some barges into the plants at the mouth of the creek, but not much farther than that. Especially at at, <clears throat> at low tide, with the the lower part of the Frankfurt Creek was affected by the tide of the Delaware River. So this is just one funny um, one funny uh, letter to the editor. Two letters to the editor and some photographs of Frankfurt Creek, purple and perfumed. Uh, that's probably because the purple dye was being used in the dye works, some dye works that day. But the, the second letter there says, tomorrow the water may be pink or yellow, depending on what particular kind of factory waste are dumped in. But the perfume is always just about the same. That is terrible. So this is what people had to live with at that point. Um, because even, even though the city had somewhat taken care of the sewage waste, the factories were still dumping all of their waste into the creek. That, that kind of pollution, industrial pollution, continued until the, until the 1970s and basically until the EPA and the Clean Water Act that John talked about at the beginning began to take effect. It's also this poor boy fell into the creek and he drowned, probably just plain drowned, but his grandfather, who was a physician blamed the pollution on the creek for killing him. I mean, they didn't fish his body out for an hour or so, um, but it, the health department person it quoted at the end of the story, admitted that Frankfurt Creek actually is a sewer. So, um, so finally in, 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 in the late 1930s, there was more agitation to try to get the federal government to relinquish its control on the creek so the city could do something. And, and uh, this is just Frankfurt Creek called a lost child because the city didn't, wasn't able to do anything because the federal government wouldn't let them do anything. And finally in 1940, there was an act passed by the House of Representatives declaring Frankfurt Creek to be a non-navigable stream, probably about 40 years after it had become non-navigable. Um, but that allowed the city then to start planning, planning for, and again, you can read these some other time, read, read that. But um, it, it basically says here, there has been no navigation on the creek since 1929 by commercial or pleasure craft. Um, but small craft, meaning those rowboats that we just saw the picture of, can reach the vicinity of Bridge Street, which isn't very far up the creek, at the higher stages of the tide. So, um, so and it also admitted that the improvements known to be contemplated by the city of Philadelphia for control of floods and abatement of pollution would be expedited if, if they had responsibility for the creek. Um, and that's what happened. So it took until 1947 for that to begin uh, because in the interim between 1940 and 1947, we had World War II when very little public works were accomplished anywhere in the country that hadn't, unless they had something to do with the war effort. Uh, and if they used concrete and steel, they basically, those two materials were war materials and, and you couldn't build anything and that's what you build sewers out of, that's what you build a lot of water pipes out of, and, and that's what you build a flood control channel out of. And that's what this report, uh, which is very detailed, very interesting report, which is up on my website um, in its entirety. Um, that's what this report uh, outlined, was the, from, from Castler Avenue down to the mouth, of the, to the Delaware River, just basically not only putting part of the original creek in a channel, 
but also digging a brand new channel to carry the water straight to the Delaware River and abandoning the, the loop that went through Bridesburg. Um, so they started doing this in the late 1940s. And where they started was up at, up upstream um, in, uh, in, in June, what, basically what we're looking at where that loop of Frankfurt Creek goes across Wyoming Avenue, which is the, the bridge in this aerial photograph, and then loops back around and then back under again. So basically Wyoming Avenue crosses Frankfurt Creek and about 2000 feet crosses Fra Frankfurt Creek, Creek three, crossed Frankfurt Creek three times. So they had to build three bridges. Um, so basically the, the first thing they did was to get rid of that second loop and dig a channel straight across uh, about where the word Frankfurt is in this slide and, and eliminate that loop. And this area either it was or, or it became the Juniata Golf Course. Um, so here, and these were not small bridges that they were, they were built, they, they built over the creek either. These were three major bridges that, that uh, the city, and, and they built them and rebuilt them several times. This is in 1916. This is the last iteration of the bridge. And you can still see two of these bridges. If you go out on the golf course toward Wyoming Avenue, you can see two of these bridges that just basically cross nothing now. Uh, but that's what used to be where the creek looped, looped. Uh, looped over to one side and then back to the other. So this is just a picture of, of, of that part of that loop being eliminated. There used to be, there was originally a, a footbridge across the creek at that point, and that's what those two piers are for. And I think the footbridge itself is, has already been taken down as in, in behind the steam shovel. Uh, this is a picture uh, showing the channel of, of the creek below uh, the Wingahawking sewer outfall. Um, and you can see the, the regrading that's been done there. Um, here's a view looking upstream at what they call the Juniata cutoff, um, you know, cutting off that little loop and with the new footbridge put in place. And once that, that, that piece of it was done, that upstream part, then below Castor Avenue, which is right below the golf course, they started uh, building a new channel. The creek uh, basically flowed here and there like a creek does. It was walled in by some of the factories that were built in and by some of the fill that had been dumped, but it had no, no real solid, solid uh, footing. And the plan was to put it in basically a concrete channel, wall it in, uh, and this is the first, the first picture in this series. And I think that's the mayor, Bernard Samuel there, pretending to operate the, the uh, steam shovel there. So he was one of these mayors that liked to get behind the heavy equipment. Maybe he actually knew how to operate it. I'm not sure. Um, so they, they started out, you can see the dates on these, and they did this fairly quickly. They, they, they did, did this new channel one, one side at a time. They would wall off one side of the creek, let it all flow on the here on the left side, and then while well, they built the channel on the right. And here's the concrete going in. And if you had a flood or a high high water here, it made a big mess in the new concrete work, and then you have to spend days clearing the mud off it. But eventually, you know, you get your channel done. And then this is what it looks like, and here's the creek at low water, basically, um, you know, flowing down the center of the channel. Uh, in the high water, I would hope, uh, I think this did eliminate a lot of the floods of the creek. Just some other pictures showing this. I sometimes I guess they built the walls of the of the. Uh, the walls of the channel first, and then they excavated out and and built the bottom. Um, and you can see here how again how these factories are built right up on the right up on the on the stream, and how much how much fill and how much sediment was probably washed down into the creek just from these parking lots where they were leveled out by by just dumping dirt.
Here's the Harbison's Dairy. And so, as I said, the last piece of this was digging a channel, a new channel, straight to the Delaware River. Um, and because this was basically a flood control project. So in a flood control project, you want to get the water out of where it's been flooding. You want to get it through there as quickly and as quickly as possible. So digging a straight channel was the best way to do that. And to do, to do this, they had to build three new bridges across this new channel and then eliminate the bridges across the old channel as they, as they eliminated that and filled it in. Um, this was part of where the new channel was going to be dug um, across an, a, basically a, a dump. Uh, and as I said before, the, the lower part of Frankfurt Creek was basically marshy, marshy land, lowlands. And uh, Philadelphia seemed to like to fill its lowlands with garbage and trash and then set it on fire to sort of compact it. This would have been a, pop, a common scene in South Philadelphia right up into the 1950s. And this is 1953 as they're digging this, this new channel. Um, again, the channel is going to go right through this dump. Um, so here's, they sort of, I guess they built the bridges sort of on, right on the ground, more or less, or just barely excavated uh, when they were building the new channel. And then they built the channel underneath the bridge. Um, they didn't build the channel and then bridge the channel. They built the bridges first. So here you can see the bridge being built before the channel has even, has even been built above, above the bridge. This is at Richmond Street. And then here, here are some of the railroad bridges closer, closer to the river that had to be built across this new channel. And finally, in 1956, you know, this nine-year project to, to, uh, to reroute the creek um, and build the new channel was, was finished. And it's quotes the water department uh, Commissioner Samuel Baxter here, he said that the project undertake, was undertaken after a half a century of flash floods. Um, so the flooding had been a problem for a long time. And so here is the, the, big, the big crane with the, with the bucket on it is, is removing the, the, the barrier between the new channel and the, and the old creek. And probably the dirt that he, that's being dug out of the, uh, out of that barrier is then being bulldozed into the to make a barrier from the old to the old channel. Um, so here's the new channel as it looked shortly after it was completed in 1956, and then here's the old channel, which you know eventually it was it was filled in. Um, and it was such, such marshy, <coughs> excuse me, such marshy ground that they had to put pilings down to support the concrete sewer that they were building. Otherwise, it would have sunk into the into the marsh. And so they built the they built this new sewer to, in the in the creek in the old creek bed, and then they covered it over and built. A, I think this might be either part of I ninety five or Aramingo Avenue on, on top of that. And then they got rid of the bridges that were once over that part of the creek. Um, they haven't gotten rid of the bridge yet, but there's no need for it anymore with the creek filled in. So basically, as I said, this was, and this is why I, th I think that this is sort of a sad, it's a sad story for a lot of ways. The way we treat our urban streams in general has been a sad story. Um, and and there's really no turning back from it when you when you when you put a when you put a stream into and make it into a combined sewer. There's really no turning back. There's no there's no bringing it to, back to daylight anymore. And um, and but then with Frankfurt Creek, it was not just all the tributaries that were taken away, but it was then just completely compromising whatever integrity the original stream had as it flowed through Frankfurt. First by building factories and and, and building right up onto the onto the banks of the creek, but then by completely uh, changing the route of the creek and the form of the creek and and carrying it straight to the Delaware River, 
Um, so it became, in, in, it, in a similar way, the Schuylkill River through Center City has been treated the same way with bulkheads and, and uh, all the way through Fairmount Park and all the way down, uh, almost all the way down to the Delaware River. Uh, it's just a giant stormwater channel that, as we've seen lately, you know, these stormwater channels that are dug that don't always manage to contain the, the flow of whatever they, we thought they would con flow, would, would, con would contain. Um, the Frankfurt Creek, I think, in general, has has managed to, the, the new channel has managed to carry whatever we've thrown at it so far, though. So there is that to be said for that. And just one more one more picture, just showing more or less, I think this was a, a picture, an aerial photograph from a year ago showing showing the creek. Um, you can see a little bit, of, a little line of green running down toward that maze of an intersection at at I-95 and the Betsy Ross Bridge, um, and then the channel running right along the, the Betsy Ross Bridge out into the river. So, so that's the that's the last picture. I'm sorry this is not this was not a cheerful story, but I you you saw the title. I, I was not I was not uh, I was not hiding that from anybody. Um, but I'd be glad to answer any questions. And if you if you think of a question, if you're if you're not here in the audience, if you're watching this online, uh, feel free to email a question any anytime to my website. There's a contact link that goes directly to my email. So thank you, thank you all. Yeah, it would be tidal uh, because the creek was tidal fairly far up. Um, I think so, yeah. And uh, so that would be tidal, and uh, and then there's a big storm sewer that comes out from where the where the where the creek bed was. That's what they built in it. So there's a big box sewer that empties out into it in in rainstorms. But um, I'm not sure. The, so I would say the quality of the water is probably the same as whatever's in the Delaware River. Other questions from the audience present? Excuse me, I plugged in the hotel. Excuse me, what's the name? At one time, with all of it, that went all the way down to the street. And the water was coming down years ago from all the way down Bridge Street into there to make the cement it. Now, Chuck and Frank are there. They don't have anything about that. And they built that, or they did for a long time to build that property. And there was a lot of water that still was needed up to here. And sinkholes in there. Yeah, well, Wissanomi Creek is a, not, it was a creek. It's a little bit. Now that creek, where did all that go from? Right? came from. Uh, I think there's a park where it's built, where it started. But probably Wissanomi Park, I think, is where it started. But that was a smaller creek than Frankfurt Creek. But it did run down through the Wissanomi neighborhood, and then did cause in the late '90s did cause some problems with homes that had to be torn down because they were undermined. And, and all of that, but that's a different creek from Frankfurt Creek. Oh, okay. well, yeah, no, it's the same. It's this, but it's the same story. It was put in a sewer, and uh, then something happened. Either something happened to undermine the houses, and and uh, it was like a small a, a small version of the Logan the Logan neighborhood. So, um, but I'm not ignoring. There's there were I, I don't know if I said this, but that map that I showed that was blank. That represents about 200 miles of streams in the city that were put underground. So I'm not trying to slight Wissanoming in that neighborhood by not talking about it. But, but um, I could be here for the next for the next week and a half talking about all of it. Yeah. While he was in Stephen Hall, and yeah. that's 
Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Other points uh, from here. Um, I was interested to hear that it was that, that Frankfurt Creek was uh, identified as navigable officially, I guess by Congress, I think you said, in 1799, which is bef just before the end of the term of President John Adams. So it's the third presidential term before Jefferson, the third president gets elected, which is awfully early in the history of the uh, Republic. And the reason for, for identifying it as navigable was Congress wanted to control it? I don't know if they wanted to control it, but I think maybe that was a time period, I'm not sure, I'm just guessing, maybe that was a time period where they were identifying navigable streams that then the army engineers, as they were called, then could, could uh, have something to do with Possibly it had something to do with building the arsenal there. Uh, and then they wanted to have some control over the stream where the arsenal was, even though the arsenal was more or less on, almost on the Delaware River. But um, so it, 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 could have been, it could have been a number of reasons. I've never looked into that, but that's an interesting, that would be interesting to look into that history. Why at that time was Frankfurt Creek uh, designated that? Although Frankfurt had been there from what, the 1680s, uh, so, um, you know, it wasn't like it was a, a, a new community. So it was already a hundred years old, even though the country was only, only if you count it from the constitution, only 12 years old. So, um, so it could have been you know, that they were- uh, made in, in 1800. In yeah, so but well, the, well, yeah, it could have been, you're right. Or, but the village of Frankfurt would- Well, was, the village would have Yeah. It yeah, it yeah. It became a borough. Frankfurt became a borough in in uh, eighteen hundred. Yeah, exactly. So, if anybody out there, uh, out there in uh, YouTube world knows knows any more about this, please share it with me. And then we were the the creek was declared non navigable. That year was what nineteen forty. Forty. Okay, and. That was in order to, or I presume that the congressional delegation from Philadelphia wanted to give the locals some ability to deal with yeah. the uh, uh, issues in the stream that the feds, I guess, weren't at that point. No, they weren't willing. There was no commerce on the creek. There was no, no reason for them to dredge it or to do anything to it. Navigation stopped, but pollution began. Um, the streams that were covered over, some of them do, as has been suggested, receive water from outside the city boundaries. Do you have any sense of how much of, of surrounding county water we're uh, now running through our sewers and into our treatment system? Well, if, 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 if it's uh, like Mill Creek starts above ground, in West Philadelphia starts above ground in Lower Marion and Montgomery County. So there's actually, when their sewers enter our sewer, when there's, I guess we don't treat, we don't charge them for the water in the creek, but we charge them for the sewage that they put into our system. So um, that's, that's a whole nother talk too, is just how, how these cooperative agreements have been made, not just to treat other community sewage because it's cheaper for them if they're uphill of the city just to let their sewage flow down into our pipes and then let us treat it than to build their own treatment plants. But we also, although those communities might not want to admit it, uh, we also provide drinking water to some suburban communities. And uh, I bet they, they don't advertise that their citizens are drinking Philadelphia water, <laughs> but, uh, which is actually very good quality, may I say now because, um, but it still has that reputation because you all laughed when I said that. <laughs> yes, we, we are aware of that reputation, although uh, many of us in this room do drink Philadelphia water. Um, the consequence about the navigability 
question is, is interesting to me from my, my EPA days, uh, because I think Congress redefined what its jurisdiction reached when it passed what's now the Clean Water Act. It used to be waters of the United States. No, it used to be navigable waters. And I think in order to uh, pass the uh, Clean Water Act and have it actually reach Frankfurt Creek and other places, they had to take out that word navigable. And I think that's what happened in 19, or part of what happened in 1970. Is that consistent with your recollection? I, I think it must have been because otherwise they would have no jurisdiction over all the small streams, which is most of the streams in the country. Yes, and now of course it's the waters of the United States and waters of the United States, the Supreme Court just announced, uh, are no longer in, gonna include wetlands that don't directly communicate with continuous streams. Is that is that how you understand that yeah. decision? Yeah. Uh, which is which is what does that mean? It, does it, that mean that the marshlands along the ocean aren't aren't it, oh aren't, oh no the marshlands along the ocean I think are still covered because the ocean is a stream? Well, uh, that's an interesting point. You You're know, a lawyer, I, you need to explain. I, I used to be, <laughs> I used to be an environmental lawyer, but that's been a while. Yeah. Um, and I have not reviewed that that decision with that in mind. Thank you for pointing that out, I will. Um, no, but that's, it, it's just, yeah, we could we could talk talk about that all night. Now, one, one more thing, if I may, um, the, uh, when when we were dealing with the city in in the early 70s, uh, the this overflow problem was the the, the 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 combined sewers were a serious issue, much more serious than upgrading the sewage treatment plants. Now remind me, uh, primary, secondary, tertiary. Were we at secondary at that point? We were probably primary then. Still primary. So we were. But I'm not, I'm not, I'm not certain about I that. I think this you're is, right. This That's, is where I get into trouble and I'll hear about it from some, I'll get an email from someone tomorrow who was the water commissioner probably tuned into this. <laughs> yeah. I, I hope so because I have a, I have a message for the water commissioner, which is a positive thing. Okay. Uh, the uh, uh, sort of the, the good news is that the city has gotten with it on kind of fixing some of this overflow problem that results from those those um, combined sewers and is has instituted this this um, uh, green city clean water yeah yeah and it's great I think it's wonderful and I I want the water department if anybody's listening from the water department I want to know how much I appreciate that are we is the are the feds helping out with that just by now probably yeah. it was an EPA mandate so I think uh, oh that it wasn't it did become a mandate yeah because when in my day that wasn't a mandate it no. was it was we were struggling with that for ages. In, in the 70s with with the city over over yeah. whether they were going to do anything it was an un, it was kind of a mandate but it was an unfunded mandate yeah. yeah i don't know how much funding we get from the federal government okay all right well anything else from this audience susan we haven't had anything from remote no, okay all righty well thank you very much appreciate your uh, being here with us well thank you we're going to continue um, to have programs on the second Tuesday of the month uh, through uh, the fall. And we, we discontinue uh, for the two cold months, but we will have programs on the second Tuesday of October, November, and December. The October one in particular is, is very exciting. It's going to be on gerrymandering. Uh, and October is archives month. So I think we, we will be uh, striving for uh, uh, getting ourselves uh, promoted through the archival specialists network to uh, 
be uh, tuned in uh, for that a lot, and uh, I hope that that's going to be quite a well-received program. I, uh, I hope we had a good audience for you remotely tonight. Thank you very much. We will be keeping this online at YouTube and Facebook uh, for the foreseeable future, and anything that uh, comes in by way of uh, supplemental information, we can figure out how to add it in. So uh, thank you all for coming tonight and the remote viewers for uh, listening. We have some uh, refreshments uh, laid out for those who were able to get here. Those who uh, haven't been coming, but who are thinking about coming back, nobody has been getting sick from coming to our meetings and we would love to have you come back uh, and, uh, and see us uh, on our regular uh, schedule the second Tuesday of the month in not too hot and not too cold months. So thank you and tune in again.